you are here at the session Systemic Alternatives for, economic, for the Economic Growth Model. Um, my name is Martha and I will guide you through this uh, second to last session. If you found your way here, then you are probably like me, a bit worried about the state of the world. It might be an understatement. Um, our linear economic growth model, as you know, has high environmental and social costs. We use up resources, we cross planetary boundaries, and we divide the economic rewards unevenly. In this session, we will try to narrow in on some alternatives to this economic growth model. So what practical things, what practical alternatives exist to the paradigm that we know now? How do we restructure society away from that growth model and towards a more holistic relationship between people and nature? Luckily for you, I will leave it to other people to answer this question because I don't know either. Uh, I have three guests with me, uh, Pablo, Arpita and Nick. Uh, you only see two of them here, but the third one, Pablo, will call in, so he will appear uh, shortly on the screen behind them. Um, and there will be room for your questions at the end, so it would be good if you can just keep them in mind and then um, I will come back to you at the end of the session. Um, but first, to get us started and to get us a bit worried again about the, the problem that we're thinking about, uh, I want to show you a short clip um, in which you will see Jason Hickel talking. Uh, you might know him, he is the author of Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World. So let's start off with that. Our addiction to economic growth is killing us. Right now, the entire global system is captive to a single idea, economic growth. Politicians rise and fall on their ability to increase GDP year on year. They promise that growth will make our lives better. But there's a catch. We can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. We're already overshooting our planet's biocapacity by nearly 60%. The consequences are all around us. Climate change, deforestation, and rapid rates of extinction. This crisis is due almost entirely to overconsumption in rich countries. They use more than three times their fair share of biocapacity. Scientists warn that the only way to prevent ecological collapse is for rich countries to scale down their consumption. This is called planned degrowth. Degrowth is not the same as austerity. The goal is to increase human well-being and happiness while reducing our economic footprint. Instead of intensifying our plunder of the earth, we can share what we already have more fairly. We can cut excess consumption by curbing advertising and taxing carbon. Introducing a basic income and a shorter working week would allow us to get rid of unnecessary jobs and redistribute labor. But the first step is to overthrow the tyranny of GDP. GDP is a crude measure of progress. When we slice down our forests for timber or strip our mountains for coal, GDP goes up. When natural disasters strike or hospital visits rise, GDP goes up. It ignores environmental and social costs. It's time for a more sensible metric, like the genuine progress indicator, which takes GDP and subtracts these negative outcomes. It accounts for the costs of growth. We need an economic model that promotes human flourishing in harmony with the planet on which we depend. Agree or disagree, I think uh, I know what the answer would be of my guests here. Um, I'm looking at the organizers. Has Pablo already logged in? Okay, so then there's no worries because we have two other guests and we will see uh, Pablo show up whenever he gets a chance. But then let me start by introducing these two other guests already to you. Um, so we have here right next to me is Arpita Bisht and she is an associate fellow at the Graduate Institute Geneva and a postdoctoral fellow at the International Institute for Social Studies in The Hague. That's a mouthful. So she came with us today uh, from the Netherlands after some uh, adventures on the train, let's say. Um, and Arpita researches social and environmental injustices rising from extraction. She is interested particularly in post-extractive solutions to the expansion of sand mining. 
Arpita's work focuses on resistance movements and the ecological distribution conflicts caused by expanding mineral commodity frontiers. That's again a mouthful, and I think you will explain to us a bit more about what that entails. Currently, her research focuses on a post-extractive future for India. And then right next to Arpita, let me introduce Nick as well before I give the floor to Arpita. Uh, Nick Meine is a geographer with a postgraduate in conflict studies who became a professional environmental activist back in 2008. So that's been a while. Uh, and he now works as a senior policy officer for systemic change at the European Environmental Bureau. He's also an investigative journalist and the author of literary non-fiction books, and one of which you might know is called Frontlines, Stories of Global Environmental Justice. He writes for various media, such as The Standard, Mo and Meta, and in these stories, he always tries to uh, connect the struggles for environmental justice to the flaws in our economic system. Um, Nick is also a guest lecturer at various universities in Belgium and the UK, and he will give us a perspective later on on uh, enabling systemic change at the European level, but also uh, further in Bhutan and other economies. Well, welcome, very, uh, very welcome here. Um, so I think we can just start with giving you the words. Uh, Arpita, could you tell us a bit? Um, I have some questions for you. So um, we've talked about a growth model, or at least uh, Jason Hickel has. Um, how can we move beyond this growth model? And, and especially what kind of challenges and alternatives do you see rise up in India? Uh, and what could a post-growth economic model then look like? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Thanks. Hi, uh, thank you for being here. Um, uh, I'm going to talk more from the perspective of uh, India, but largely also from the global south. So of course, these problems of economic growth, uh, we know there, there are many of them, but I think it is, um, on the other side, you often have these uh, discussions of the fact that, yes, there have been some uh, positive changes to large sections of global population in terms of poverty, et cetera, right? People have come out. I think what's really important to understand there, the first thing is what is the standard from which people have risen? And I think the standard that we have to understand structurally is from uh, colonial times, from, from deprivations that were caused due to these uh, systems. And so uh, what, has, what we've seen as a trajectory is, yes, there is more, maybe slightly more um, um, progress, but that is over the last 70-odd uh, years. First off, the, the benchmark was very low to begin with, right? So that's important. And then what's happened is that, um, uh, is, is these histories, because you had, uh, these, this moment of uh, colonialism which went, and then what we uh, in academia describe sort of as neo-colonialism. So economic growth across the global south was largely Im uh, imposed or hand-twisted uh, upon countries uh, around 1989 uh, to 91 with uh, the Washington Consensus uh, and these large structural uh, macroeconomic reforms that were imposed across the world. Uh, in India, economic growth properly arrived in 1991 as a part of this, uh, which was happening uh, again across the world. So that's the moment that you really see changes in, uh, uh, in, in, in both, for instance, how the metrics defines as um, in, increase of the number of people in the middle class, et cetera, right? But what is important and what is missed from these calculations is, uh, first of all, of course, the environmental degradation, but also marginalized people. So what you're seeing, for instance, today is that India, for instance, because of economic growth, has a huge number of billionaires, a lot of millionaires, but at the same time, you have large sections of people in poverty at you know $2 a day and many, many more at something like $2.1, you know, $2.2, <clears throat> really precarious situations. So you see that, yes, uh, wealth has increased for certain sections of populations, but <clears throat> there is also this uh, factor of larger sections of uh, society that are continuing to be deprived more and more, pushed to the frontiers, pushed to the frontiers, new frontiers opening up. And then I think, again, these, th there are two dimensions to this because there is the linkages between the global north and the south, 
and then there are uh, increasingly now uh, similar um, things happening within countries. I can say that about India because you have such large divides that these kinds of um, emission consumptions within the elite of um, societies are increasing more and more. And that is happening across the world, right? So these kinds of challenges are uh, important to sort of uh, focus on when we look at this. So um, yeah, so if we look at the challenges to these models, I think <clears throat> we've had so much um, of, uh, of brainwashing, of propaganda in, in a way to say uh, pro-growth uh, imposition that it is difficult. I think at today's time, a lot of people's perceptions even within lower income groups, et cetera, is that we will get to this place. But I think that's of course a lot of sort of brainwashing, et cetera. Uh, I think another big challenge area is resistance or inertia from the elites because why would uh, you know either the global or, or internal ever want uh, to change that system. So then the responsibility uh, in a way falls upon what I think is like s social movements. And we see that increasing uh, across the world. We see that in Europe, we see that in North America, South America, across the world. In India, we have had some of the largest movements, uh, you know, uh, trying to halt this um, movement of growth. So, so there is, yeah, I think these are sort of the um, big challenges. <clears throat> and if we move to, um, to degrowth, for instance, ideas in terms of uh, solutions or alternatives. Uh, degrowth just sort of definitionally is defined sort of as a planned and democratic uh, reduction of both production and consumption, um, whilst, uh, you know, in order to reduce inequities, uh, in order to reduce environmental, um, negative env environmental implications, and to increase well-being. But particularly from the context of the global south, uh, I like to use the term post-growth. Right, because degrowth is something, for instance, I think extremely relevant for two sections, Global North and uh, the elite within the Global South. But overall, I think in terms of alternatives, we need to look at something called post-growth and how this is conceptualized is four things. Uh, degrowth, first. A growth, which is growth agnosticism, which means that you know, it's, we don't care about the GDP as long as we are meeting certain other metrics, be it education or, or, uh, or healthcare or uh, things for all. The third thing is what we call a steady state economics, which means that in large sections of the world, you want to first increase the basic material and energy, uh, food consumption, nutrition, all of these levels before you talk about any. So, so first we need to also collectively increase that level, get to a steady state. Uh, and, the th and the fourth thing which is extremely important is what we call post-development. This is a critical school of thought which exactly discusses these imposed ideas of development, developmentalism. Uh, which uh, end up in practice uh, across the Global South affecting people, um, marginalized communities, socioeconomically uh, marginalized peoples, and uh, often indigenous peoples, or people living at frontiers of resource extraction. Uh, so, so, these, uh, so that is one thing that presents uh, you know, an important uh, alternative uh, economic model. Yeah, this is my time. Okay, yeah, sure. That's, oh. That was really interesting, uh, these four pillars. Um, so we're moving to Nick before I have a chance to ask my questions, and you have so too. Um, Nick, we heard about uh, the practices and the alternatives rising up in India. We can talk about those later. Um, but to you, I would like to ask the question, uh, how do we put these into practice? And uh, specifically, uh, you may elaborate a bit on the policy in the EU, but also in the other um, economies that you are uh, an expert in. How do, how do we really put the alternatives into practice? What is going on right now to do so? Sure, I'll uh, bring some examples of things. Uh, first, I'd like to react also to what Jason said. Do you agree or not? I mean, of course, I agree with Jason. I also agree with Arpita, so it's not really a, a debate on the sharp edge here. Uh, we are all aligned in our thinking, I think. What I wanted to maybe complement to that is that recently we had the, the, the latest uh, IPCC report and for the first time ever they embraced degrowth as a strategy to increase well-being for all. Uh, writing in a way the same things that we have been writing for 10 years and that Jason has been talking about. So there is a, a change in the debate, both the degrowth movement is growing but also you see that it's being reflected in media, it's being reflected in IPCC and an example in practice in Flanders, which is not the obvious candidate for uh, really embracing a degrowth uh, agenda, but there is the, 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 the example for that the, the 40 largest 
industrial meat uh, factories, I would say, uh, in this region uh, are going to be closed by 2025, top down, from a, st a state that says, look, if we don't close them, we're not going to get there with our uh, nitrogen emissions and so forth. And we're going to phase them out. And that's an example, and we, need, we could do that with many other sectors on fossil fuels as well. Uh, um, but maybe to go back to your question, uh, with um, yeah, making also the link with India. Um, so in India, I've, I've also worked there a bit. Um, you see this wonderful movement, grassroots, people uniting at the, at the ground level to react against this uh, growth economy, which is pushing for ever more extraction, causing all this damage. And that's good, and we need to support that. Um, in, 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 in Belgium or in, or in the UK, in Europe, we have also things like ex, uh, Extinction Rebellion, Code Red, and the Galande, all these movements that are there to say stop to this, to this model, basically. Uh, but there are also examples more top-down. Uh, and then uh, Bhutan is a good example, I think, because they have been practicing for 30 years an economy that's not focused on GDP. So they had this king who said, jokingly a bit like uh, for us GDP for us it's cross-national happiness and ha everybody laughed a bit it sounded a bit wishy-washy you know but then he got some experts to work on indicators and targets and then they, they they had a model and then they looked at all the big decisions like should we join world trade organization like almost any country in the world except for Vatican City and North Korea and so forth uh, and then they just looked at what will that do with our cross-national happiness uh, we will have to allow big mining companies in. We will have to allow McDonald's in. We will have to allow all this advertisement from the West in. Is that going to have a net benefit for us or not? And they said no. And so you might think, like, if they say they're not in the World Trade Organization, they're not taking part in our global game of neoliberalism, then it must be very hard for them, right? Well, the results are staggering. In 22 years of experiencing this model, their life expectancy went up 16 years. So people in Bhutan, every year, they got almost another year to live because of this economic model. That's one, that's health. On poverty, the World Bank says that they have a, a kind of record in reducing poverty per capita. So on social issues, they are great. And they are the first country in the world to be climate neutral. They already absorb more emissions than they emit. For, for a developing country, we should be with all our money be ahead of them, but they are doing it with very little money. Why? Because they have other priorities. So they go for reforestation, they go for electric cars, and they don't go for McDonald's and big mining uh, and that kind of stuff. So it's an example of it, how it can work. And I'm very happy that uh, I finally succeeded in convincing the people from Bhutan to be in a Stockholm Plus 50 meeting in a month from now. Uh, they'll be in a panel that we organize to share their experience together with other pioneering examples uh, of governments working on another economic model. And that brings me maybe to Europe, where you have already uh, a coalition of well-being economy governments. They started with three, Scotland, Iceland, New Zealand, then, they, then Finland and Wales joined, and there are other countries who are looking at it. And they also engage themselves and, and they identify themselves as, we should be going for, for a well-being economy, which embraces, again, the social, the health, the environment, everything together, and puts it on top of just growing the economy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as Jason Hickel said, it can mean many things, a work time reduction, basic incomes, various things. And so far, it's not like a strict uh, guidebook or something, but every government is, is looking at, at each other, like how can we, in our country, do something in, towards that direction. And then, yeah, my, my work is mostly on the EU, and there I see also an, an evolution in the debate. I've been working on this topic for, for eight years at the EU level. And when we were talking about neoliberalism and growth eight years ago, we were really radical, strange nutwits, you know. Uh, but our reports were now also cited in the, in the IPCC. We have now uh, things like the Green Deal, which is still a green growth model, I know. But, we, but more interestingly, what very people know, we now have the Eight Environment Action Plan, which is like the 10-year plan of the EU on what they will do, all things environmental, which is bigger than the Green Deal. Uh, and in that plan, they have things like we need another dashboard of indicators than GDP. They have like the well-being economy embraced as something that they want to go for. Now it's a matter of like implementing because it's a political declaration. It's not like, well, although this time the three institutions, the Commission, the Parliament and the Council all embraced it and adopted it as law. So actually it is binding but still a long way to go to implement it. But there is that framework already at the EU level, which has come there also with grassroots 
uh, a push like the whole Fridays for, remo for, for um, future... Fridays for, Fridays Fridays for, for future uh, movement, right? Right? I think so. Yes, Friday for Future. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah. There is also Friday for Sabotage nowadays, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. But uh, they are also part of the reason why the EU now has this big uh, green deal. Why so many green MEPs have come to the Parliament? Why this debate is gaining traction? So activism works in a sense, you know. Uh, and in Europe, we have a bit of both. It's a, I, I often say like the EU is like a Jackson Pollock painting, with splashes going in all directions. It's very confusing, and anyone can see anyone anything in it. But we have these grassroots movements. We have also top-down some big plans. And, and there is potential, at least, to make progress on the degrowth debate in the EU. But there is a long way to go. And just the Green Deal as it is now, it's not enough yet. That's for sure. That's maybe the brief introduction. Yeah, sure. That's, uh, that's great. I'm thinking uh, whether we should wait for it. Yeah, we should have Pablo up on the screen in a minute. Um, I will already introduce him to you, because I haven't done that yet. Now I have to find my little card that introduces him, which of course, yes, I have found. Tom, Tom, Tom. So I will introduce you to our furthest away speaker, I think from maybe the whole day, um, is Pablo Salon. We have him up on the screen. Hi, welcome, Pablo. Can you hear us? Great, great. I will introduce you for a bit and then I will give you the floor. Um, so Pablo is calling in from Bolivia and he is an activist, researcher and policy analyst in the areas of water, climate, the environment, trade, finance and systemic alternatives. So uh, an ideal guest for today, I think. Uh, some highlights of his long and impressive career are as follows. He was Bolivia's ambassador to the United Nations. He was chief negotiator of Bolivia. And he co-organized the People's World Conference on Climate Change and Mother Earth's Rights in Bolivia. His commitment to fight deforestation and climate change led him then to head the NGO Focus on the Global South until 2015. And currently, he is the director of the Salon Foundation in Bolivia and coordinates the Systemic Alternatives Initiative. So, uh, welcome, Pablo, to the, to the event. Um, I would like to ask you, so we've already had uh, two introductions by Nick and Arpita, um, but you sort of know, I think, the content of what, what they were going to say, but I want to ask you to move a step back. So we talked about um, the alternatives and looking forward to the future, but could you tell us or elaborate a bit again on what is precisely wrong with the current system and whether you think that growth is the only problem or are we dealing with many problems at once? And one thing I would also like to ask you that I've read uh, from, your, uh, from your biography and your presence online is that you think resistance is prominent in building alternatives. Could you elaborate a bit on that as well, please? Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, yes, I think we, we're living, we say it's systemic crisis. It's not only one crisis, there are several systemic crises. One have, some have to deal with the economy, some have to deal with the environment, some have to deal with uh, politics, with geopolitics, and they're all interconnected. I think degrowth is one part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. And we have to look at other alternatives and seek com complementarity with these other alternatives. So I think that other part of the solution we will find when we look at ecofeminism, for, for example, or when we look at rights of nature, or uh, when we look at the deglobalization, or when we look at Buen Vivir, or Bibir Bien that comes from, from the Andean region. So, and each one of them, of these different visions and alternatives is very strong in one aspect. But in order to address this systemic crisis, we need to address it from all these different perspectives. So, for example, when we say system change, we think mainly on capitalism, and it is 
a big part of the problem. The logic of capital is driving, in a way, this systemic crisis because in the logic of capital, you want to make more and more profit. And you contaminate everything, even the, the, the green transition. For example, if you want to produce uh, electric cars for business and to gain profit, we're going to destroy the planet. Currently in, in the world, we have uh, 1.4 billion um, cars. If you think that you're going to replace that by electric cars, that is madness. And there is, uh, and for example, I'm in a country where we have the biggest reserve of lithium in the world. And I see the companies and some called green corporations and things like that, looking at the lithium as a new natural resource to be extracted without thinking on the severe impacts that's going to have uh, in the highlands where the salt lakes are here in Bolivia. So to get out of the logic of profit and capital is key. Uh, it's not only a problem of producing less, it's what is the logic that drives production, that drives extractivism. But this is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is anthropocentrism. We treat nature as if, if it is a, a thing, an, an object. We don't see nature as we humans are part of nature. And if we begin to change this vision, then we enter the, the world of the rights of nature. Because when we speak about rights of nature, we are saying, okay, nature has also rights and we should respect the rights of nature and the movement of rights of nature has grown in the past decade in an amazing way just a couple of weeks ago the constitutional assembly of chile has uh, agreed voted by more than two-thirds to include in its constitution the rights of nature approach and has established that nature has certain rights that have to be respected and there are mechanisms to guarantee that. To have a non-anthropocentric approach for me is key for everything. Let's look at multilateralism. Let's look at the UN. Why the UN climate conferences fail and they will always fail. For me, I have followed them for the past 14 years and every, every time, it's a worst result. Because the main uh, players in a climate conference of the UN are governments, are politicians. Civil society has less than five minutes to speak and nature is not present at all. So we need a different kind of multilateralism that includes really people with uh, the power not only to participate, but to decide, and that includes nature. If we want to have a different outcome from this multilateral uh, talks and negotiations, uh, we need to rethink our democracy. The democracy in Belgium, in Bolivia, everywhere is an anthropocentric democracy. We are the only ones that speak for everybody, but we are just one tiny part of the community of the earth. We don't, we have to rethink democracy so that we have the forests having representation in our democracy. We have the rivers having representation, the oceans, uh, the animals and so on. A new kind of democracy that is not anthropocentric. And I think this is another key, uh, very important part of the, of the puzzle, no? Another issue that we speak uh, very little about is the issue of patriarchy. I think that we have to learn very much from ecofeminism that in the way we treat nature is the way we treat women. And this strong movement that we have in, in, in many countries that my territory, my body uh, is giving us a very strong message this anthropocentric approach to nature 
is an anthropocentric approach that we also have and has developed into what we know as a patriarchal system that is suppressing great part of humans and we have to address it. And so we have to deal with all these issues, not only greenhouse gas emissions, which is of course very important. We also have to deal with colonialism. What is the new colonialism of climate change? Uh, they, I was in Glasgow, they have approved solutions for us, for the Amazon. Come on, did you ask us? Did you ask the indigenous people? That is a new kind of colonialism. Let's say the UN said in 2015, 2015, that's six years, seven years ago, that in the uh, ODS 15.2, we were going to reduce deforestation by zero by 2020. So there shouldn't be no deforestation now by 2020. And they came to Glasgow saying, oh, we are building a new agreement to save forests. We're going to reduce deforestation by 2030 without even remembering what they committed to do uh, five, six years ago and how they want to do it. Oh, they are building a fund for carbon markets, especially in relation to forests. One billion um, dollars. They are approving loans to uh, promote private investments in the forest. But they are not saying, okay, you know, what has failed in the issue of deforestation is that we have not learned from the indigenous visions that have preserved forests for centuries. And if we're going to ask for support, the first thing we have to do is hear them and support their initiatives and not promote more private initiatives that are going to expand uh, agribusiness and deforest more. Well, these are some of the visions that I want to say just to finish. For me, if we want to address climate change, we have to address the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has had a very bad impact in all the climate initiatives around the world. So everything is linked and we have to have an approach that deals with all this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. That I'm very happy that we got Pablo on the line for this last contribution. Um, there's a lot of it in there. The eco-feminist thread couldn't be more relevant today with what's happening in the US with the Roe versus Wade. Um, so thanks for, for bringing all that uh, into the debate. Uh, I have uh, some questions prepared, but I also saw you taking notes. And maybe I should just start by asking if there's anything that you would like to um, respond to each other. I see you grabbing onto the mic, Nick, so go ahead. Well, yeah, I'd like to also thank uh, Paolo and react to the last thing that he said, because I had it on my paper already as one of the constructive ways to implement a way forward now. Like, indeed, I, the war is there and we can't just ignore it. And there is a debate in Europe about blocking imports of fossil fuels from Russia, which I have said from the very beginning, like, let's, let's just start blocking all the coal, all the oil, all the gas that we are now importing and paying. We have to know around today, since 24 February, we from Europe have paid 50 billion dollars to Putin. So everyone, everyone who goes with his SUV car to fill the tank also fills the tank of a Russian tank mm -hmm. who now drives over the border in Ukraine. So that's what we are doing. So we should stop that first, maybe. And actually, that's a political debate that's like high on the agenda. First we were saying it, now the European Parliament voted, uh, like, let's just stop it. And now the Commission is saying by the end of the year we'll stop the oil. The gas is a difficult one because it's fixed with these pipelines, but that's maybe the next one to stop. And once we are there, let's just start stopping all the import from all the bad mm. dictators all over the world that we are funding with our money. And that's maybe one strategy to get to a, a, a society without oil and gas and coal, because now we are forced to look into the alternatives. But we have to do it now. We, what we shouldn't be doing is just replace it with Rush, Russian gas, with fracked gas from the US, which is put in, in tankers. And, and just now, NG made a big deal to bring that to Belgium as well. And uh, that's even worse for the climate, according to the science, with the methane emissions from the fracked gas. So indeed, like the, the choices that we make now in relation to the war, in relation to climate change, are going to affect the future for a very big 
in a very weak way, and there are really two very different ways to react. Either we just replace the problem, we just displace the problem, kick the can further down the road as it gets bigger, or we now use the opportunity to, to leap forward and say, well, let's now let's really get rid of this liquid dope which we are all addicted to in this country uh, and in our society in general. It's time for rehab. This is an interesting case that you bring because it, it points out something that I'd like to ask maybe to Arpita. Um, the case of uh, buying oil or, or gasoline, etc. On the one hand, it's a, it's a policy choice, so we can do something top down. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also an individual choice. And we hear this a lot in the narrative about degrowth, um, or maybe not in the narrative that you would like to, to bring to the table. This idea of you can uh, vote with your euros or vote with your dollars, and you can uh, put your money where your mouth is. You can make the change. Uh, how do you see that relationship between policy on the one hand and individual um, responsibility on the other? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll address that first and then also to, yes. uh, you know, some things. Gladly. I think that, of course, it's very important for us to make uh, individual choices, but they are never going to be enough. Because unless you have structural, because the problems are structural, the scales of... Um, uh, goods moving, raw materials moving, extraction, that is, um, you know, also it's sometimes a lot of it is also beyond individual choices, the waste. So absolutely we have to take certain degree of um, uh, responsibility and I think all of us should, but I think that is not enough. We also have to engage uh, with each other collectively in ways to pressure the systems to change because if you don't do that, uh, your individual choices are gonna have, um, uh, yes, an impact, uh, but more of an impact on yourself. And there is also a lot of this research, for instance, you know, on psychology of consumption, how you, you know, um, sometimes uh, taking actually little individual things can, can, pr can make you feel so much better about yourself that you then do not engage in other forms of action to force, let's say, the state, uh, you know, or, or multinational corporations. So you leave that, and that is, that is the risk, you know, uh, with multinationals, with, with the state, with states around. Uh, with war, absolutely, and I think first off, like all war, right? Like uh, Ukraine and, and and Palestine, everywhere, everywhere. There's there's all of this emission that is completely, um, uh, completely wasteful emission. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the military budgets going up, all of this. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's absolutely one of the something that uh, in the degrowth movement, but everywhere we've been talking about forever. You know, the the maybe the abolition of military or something, because who are you fighting and for what and um, you know, and I think there's also uh, other interesting things with growth because uh, growth in itself um, sometimes happens with this, um, uh, whereas on the other hand you have uh, oppressions of people, right? The more people you can oppress, you can uh, take in the, the labor uh, or, or take the labor surplus. So all of these kinds of discussions I think are um, yeah, so important, but also to, uh, to Pablo's point, I mean, I'd also sort of talked, uh, thought uh, about all of these things, you know, about how much we need to incorporate ideas of like uh, care and community and, you know, uh, from the eco-feminists and from feminist political ecology lenses into our, uh, you know, uh, our relation with nature, but our relation also with uh, non-human species, you know, which we often forget. And, and then that then also connects, for instance, to our own selves you know, how, how, how we engage with nature creates alienation. Like you see in many places uh, in, in urban areas, you have extremely alienated individuals because we've lost our connection to nature. And, and so, so these ideas of care and harm go both in, within ourselves and out into our society. So I think there are so many, yeah, of these different perspectives, but. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe one last question from me uh, for Pablo before we move on to questions from the audience. Um, so Arpita also said something about uh, uh, bringing collective demands to policymakers and organizing, etc. Uh, Pablo, you also mentioned resistance at be as being at, at the heart of uh, change. Can you say a bit about that? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. No. For, for example, I think the, the driver of change is resistance. Um, if we want to say, for example, the, the Amazon here, the main force is the resistance of uh, uh, Afro people, indigenous people. Uh, without that resistance, it's impossible to save the forest. And um, 
it is in that resistance that we see change happening. I was in Chile in 2019, and the, the, it, it was amazing. There was really an uprise from different uh, uh, groups, uh, mainly coming from, from, from the youth. And I went back just uh, a couple of months ago, and that resistance created a new moment in Chile, the most neoliberal country in, in, in South America and Latin America. And now a constitutional assembly where the majority are um, young people, amazing, coming not from traditional political parties and coming with very different ideas. Like for example, we, we want to include rights of nature. We want to uh, uh, approve um, some new um, articles to stop the privatization of water. We want to stop extractivism. We want to have an eco new text of the of the constitution and this is very much the result of a process that took several years but now you can see it and if we look here and there we are going to see how this process are evolving it's not easy we also have situations like in my country where we did one step forward and now we have two step backwards. And, uh, now Bolivia is not what it was 10 years ago. We are not an example in preserving nature. Uh, and, and for me, the most important thing is not the speeches, not the discourse, it's practice. It's what we do in reality. And this is valid for the left and for the right because we have seen backlashes uh, very strong coming also from progressive movement. And what is the key thing to, to prevent that thing from happening? Self-organization from the people, self-mobilization, auto-determination. I believe much more in what comes from society than what comes from state after being uh, several years in the state. I see Nick wibbling on his chair. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to react. Yes, of thank course. you. <laughs> yeah, this is indeed. I mean, I totally agree, of course. And and to compliment uh, you, Pablo, uh, on on the resistance is indeed the, the the way for change. This is even science. This is not just some social theory, some ideas, some some willingness. There is uh, a science like the Global Atlas for Environmental Justice showing that the movement for resistance is growing. It's never been as big as it is now. And there is a systemic scientist who I learned from through Naomi Klein, who was in this same stage talking about him, Brad Werner, who did this systemic analysis in a paper, which he then titled, Is Earth F Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I can't say that word here, uh, to get attention for his paper. And in his model, the best chances to reverse course of the great acceleration that we are all on and which is leading to disaster would be people really sticking sticks in the wheels of the extractive industry and the mining industry and the oil industry. That was the, the, the action type, intervention type, that gave most hope in his model to like reverse just from, from the brink of, of, of the edge uh, of, of a collapse, I would say. Uh, and then if, if you look at it, there are indeed so many movements out here. I just already named Extinction Rebellion and Friday for Future, but you see now, like for example, Grundrecht uh, fighting back against this PFOS uh, pollution. It's also a bottom-up resistance with effect, with real world effects. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also Klimatsak, like 60,000 people in this country suing the state winning this court case, that's also a resistance form. And I see everywhere, like, it, it's happening in a way. We're not there yet, but it's indeed, it doesn't work with just some mouse clicks and an extra sweater uh, and to turn the, yeah. It, it works with communities of people who organize themselves together, and they all together form like this, this imaginary country blockadia, as, as uh, yeah? and Naomi Klein also calls it, sticking putting sticks in the wheels. And then you have other communities of builders who build the alternatives, like in CSA farms, community farms, 500 people together on a farm, or in the Mac fabric in, in, in Antwerp, 100 makers working together in, in an old factory, where people come together to, to build the alternative. But it, it's really important to do it together. Also for this good feeling that you talked about, like maybe it doesn't have any effect on, on the whole climate change curve, but it makes you feel like, okay, I'm a tiny part of the whole bigger movement, the resistance movement, and one day our kids are going to ask the question, 
hey, dad, did you colonize my future? <laughs> and if you were not doing that, in which part of the resistance movement were you? Mm. And if you don't have kids, your inner devils will ask this question. So <laughs> do something. So no worries about that. Um, thank you so much. Maybe we can turn on the lights on the audience because we have about 15 minutes left uh, on the clock. And this is meant to be an interactive discussion with you as well. I'm sure you have some questions. Um, is there someone in the audience with a, um, a microphone, Kiki or Jana? Oh, perfect. Great. Um, so if you have a question, let me first say uh, be concise and also be clear about what the question is. And maybe even if possible, uh, direct it to one of the speakers so they know what to pre prepare for. So just raise your hands and I will uh, see who's got a question. Yeah, we can start with the um, man in the suit. <laughs> suit, the man in the suit. The man in the suit. The man in the suit. The man in the uh, suit. Works for NGO Federatie. Yes. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Manon uh, about uh, Bhutan. You told us that um, the concentration on happiness and well-being of this country also led to less poverty. I'm interested how did, uh, what's the connection between concentration on well-being and uh, less poverty? Well, uh, I don't know all the details of their framework, but I do know they have like these, these indicators, these targets, these goals, like you have in the sustainable development goals, but then for Bhutan. And all the decisions they take, that's the key difference. It's not like they have this uh, separate uh, ministries all doing their own little thing. It's like coordinated from the from the top down. Like all the decisions you take, whether it's in the, the health ministry or the social affairs ministry, have to be checked according to these targets and indicators that are all together contributing to the well-being. And it's because of being so holistic, which is a bit different from how we do it here, where we have every minister fighting for his turf and with doing what he can with his or her budget and, and, and yeah, sometimes undercutting what other ministries do. That's a bit uh, an issue here. And I think that's part of the reason why it, it worked there, that they have not just the framework and the indicators, but that they, that they, that they have it really holistically all over the government. Um, yeah, there are, I can later chat with you and refer to some studies I have in my bibliography of my book, some more detailed studies on, on how they did it. Um, but if even the World Bank, who is actually normally, you would not suspect to be a big fan of a very non-neoliberal economic model, if even they are congratulating Bhutan for reducing poverty, for me, that was like the most telling example that something is going on there. Uh, because apparently even the enemies of their model are saying like, yeah, well, not bad. <laughs> but let's uh, maybe follow up after the group. Yep. Um, then I'm gonna keep referring to people in terms of their clothing. The uh, guy with the s nice sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, I have a question for uh, Pablo. Um, I thought it was really interesting on the rights of nature debate. Here in Europe, uh, it's somewhat of a growing uh, idea being pushed on by uh, uh, Stop Ecocide and other campaigns. Um, however, it's still, it's still new in the context that um, the European v vision of, of, of nature is very different from the indigenous perspective that is has really pushed forth the the rights of nature in, in Latin America. I'm wondering also, since you mentioned that Bolivia was somewhat of a model ten years ago and has has shifted, has changed. Um, here in Europe, if the rights of nature were to be implemented, what can uh, we learn from the the positive rights of nature movement in in Bolivia to what it is today? In a way, I want to learn also like. How do you see the rights of nature being from a, a strong movement 10 years ago to now being dwindled? And yeah, and what lessons can, Europe, can Europeans learn from that? Um, yes, well, fr first I want to say that the, the main promoters of the rights of nature, the, the concept of rights of nature, didn't come from the indigenous people. Huh? It came more from the North 
Thomas Berry in, 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 the, in the United States was one that articulated the issue of the rights of nature. Indigenous people are the other stream. We won't find the word rights in indigenous people. But indigenous people say we are part of nature. Nature is our home. So there isn't that distinction that we are something different that has the rights and the other part doesn't have rights. But the, the, the vision has developed. And if you look now, we will find cases, um, laws being passed at municipal level, national level, not only in South America, uh, there are more than 200 uh, different laws or, or sentences from judicial systems. Also uh, in North America, in Australia, New Zealand, there is just one recent one that passed in Spain. Uh, so I think it's much broader and it's very interesting because there are different approaches. The main is you would say, okay, nature has rights. So this means this river has the right to defend itself because it's being polluted. And the river as such can sue those companies or whoever is destroying the river. Not because it's going to affect people. People have already the right to sue if the river is polluted and affects humans, but the river itself has the right to defend and that means you give standing to the river, you give standing to a lake, you give standing to uh, uh, coral reefs, you give standing to animals. And this means a, a, a total change in the judicial system at all, because, hey, this means that if I do um, fracking, or if I build a huge mega dam, uh, the fishes that can be affected will have standing in a trial, in a court case. And it depends on how the, the different laws have evolved. Some say, okay, then we should establish guardians for those that are being affected from um, the civil society. So that, for example, there is uh, someone that will take care and will look at the defense of those that are going to be affected because of this mega dam. Or we should stop this project because it will affect the Amazon. We have had cases like that in Colombia. So it, it changes everything because it means if nature has rights, then you cannot treat it as, as just a thing. For me, the main issue, the, the key word in, in, in this systemic change is equilibrium, balance. Everything that we do must seek balance with nature, with other human, uh, humans, with communities, the main goal is to reestablish the, the, the balance of the earth system and the earth community. This is key and everything that contributes in that way, it can be the care approach, the rights of nature approach, the degrowth approach will contribute to this. But if we don't find a new balance between humans and with nature, I think we're not going to be able to address this huge um, systemic crisis that we are facing. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Um, yes, in the back. Oh, is there someone who has a question for Arpita? Maybe I can range them out in that way. Okay, here in the front, the man with the shirt. <laughs> Just <Perfect>. you are. <laughs> Hope I'm not the only person wearing a shirt today. But uh, I, I have a question for Ms. Bisht, uh, talking about the importance of resistance in, in achieving systemic alternatives. I wonder how you look at, and this is an age-old question, um, resistance from within, talking about getting rights for nature, and resistance outside of it, commune, setting up your own systems, taking into account the fact that all of us tend to agree that the current system hasn't been successful because of the victims. 
but there's so many people with much more power and money across the world for who this system has been exceptionally successful, from politicians who have gone in five decades from humble civil servants to being of the top elite, high-income, multi multinational corporations. So I wonder how you look at it, especially from an, from an Indian context with the local elite as well. Yeah, I think it's very difficult to expect the elite who have benefited. Of course, there would be exceptions, and I think it's important, uh, you know, um, to have allies in that way, and, and maybe we are, you know, uh, all of us here probably are privileged, and so, you know, of course, uh, of course, one has to support uh, in that way, but I think the true power comes from the grassroots in the numbers and you know, uh, and, and that's really something that's difficult to replace. And you can have structural changes from the top if there is like exceptions like Bhutan. And, and it's, uh, it's possible, but I mean, we see sort of the power of um, resistance in the case in India last year where we had these three big farm laws that the government introduced, which were uh, essentially to convert India's still like 60, 70% peasant population, small holding, to essentially introduce a neoliberal economic model of agribusiness. And, and the peaceful, completely peaceful protest lasted for up to a year. And you know, uh, and eventually the state, the state, which is an extremely authoritarian, hard right fundamentalist state, uh, had to back down. Uh, but you saw in that, you know, of course the elites would support, but uh, but yeah, true resistance, uh, you know, I, you can support as allies, but I think you need to build it. But absolutely, there is space for, uh, for, for us, right? Like in terms of, yeah, the support, the internationalism, how a movement gets popularity, then adds pressure. So I think all of these things are important places where, you know, all of us can play an important role. Thank you so much. I'm uh, very sad that I have to close it down already because I feel like we're just getting started. But I really can't go over time because there is one last session for you, uh, which is the final session of the festival as well, um, which will be a, uh, a session of questions directed at Miriam Kitir, Els Hertoga, Jean Bosset, and Anne Peters, who will answer all the urgent questions, uh, so I've heard, uh, that came up during the session. So maybe if there's questions rising from here, uh, you can ask them um, and confront them with it. Uh, I'm going to remember a lot from this session, but especially the, the force of resistance and the, the, the call to keep doing that in, in what shape or form that we can. And also one that I found quite nice is that the importance of joy in doing that as well, uh, in building allyship and, and, and building communities. Uh, so that's, yeah, an, a nice takeaway. Um, I want to also thank the organizers again. So you are here, so you know who is organizing this, but I'm going to repeat it again. Uh, it's El Val Valve, um, the NGO Federatie and Vlier Uwas. Um, and they are also the ones inviting you to the final debate. Uh, and I want to thank Kiki and Jana for being the, the, yeah, the main organizers of this event and making all of this possible. They're over there and over there. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I think you have about seven minutes to go to the bathroom, have a drink, and uh, then you can come back here for the final session. Thank you for being in the room today.